go. Hello. Hello again, everyone. It's good to see you again. I'm Linny Blake. I'm from the Manchester Centre for Gothic Studies based at MMU. We're a research centre that specialises in all aspects of the darkness. So it's, it's my enormous pleasure uh, to introduce Corinne Hardy to you, director of this film, obviously, also 2018's The Nun, um, and currently showrunner on Gangs of London. Um, I, I, I love Corinne's work, um, and this film in particular, which I've, I've written about, um, and will probably be asking sort of, um, I think the word that Dom used this morning was poncy questions um, about the meanings <laughs> of the film. Um, at a later point, but but Corin's brought with him um, a presentation uh, about the the film, the, uh, particularly the effects of the film. Um, he's going to run through that first um, and talk. Uh, having and and I think we really need to give some maximum kudos to this man for struggling with two enormous bags of prosthetics out of London on a train on a Friday night to Manchester. So for that alone, I think. Um, Corin, we thank you. No worries. So, so I'm going to hand over to him, and I will I will come back at at, at some point to to ask some policy questions, um, and then I'll hand it over to you guys because I'm sure there's loads of stuff you want I to think, ask. I think you should ask any policy questions during any time I'm doing this. So oh, okay, fair yeah, enough. There's no there's no structure to this. Yep. Um, I just thought uh, if I'm coming to Manchester to screen a hallow for you, it, I, 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 I do called monsters and movies. And should we bring some monsters? Uh, they are my um, favourite friends. So, yeah, I, I, I kind of packed them all in a bag and, and brought them up. So feel free when this is done to come and have a look at what you see here, which is Cora and the sort of lead, I think we call it Sinuous Hallow, uh, and, that, and the Book of Invasions as well, which I brought, which has got a lot of illustrations in it. Um, it's quite emotional for me watching that, actually, because I haven't watched it for a long time, and I've been in the complete Gangs of London mode for four and a half years, and um, which is a completely different world, but uh, takes a similar amount of effort to kind of bring to life. Um, but The Hallow was my first film in, you know, we made it in 2014, and it took me eight years to get it from coming up with the idea um, working on it originally with Tom Deville, a, a, a writer I collaborated with, and then getting it kind of uh, financed and then rewriting it and then uh, eventually going to Ireland and shooting it all over Ireland. And it was sort of about 75% location uh, in the middle of nowhere in, in the, the peat bog fields of Ireland, l largely in the rain. and. Um, it was a mission. Um, I remember, you know, the, the, you can probably tell a lot of the inspirations. I'm sure they have some of your favorite movies too. I wanted to do a, um, a creature feature that, that sort of took time to expose itself as being that, but that is ultimately what I wanted to make. Um, but, but to sort of play with different sort of subgenres of horror uh, along the way. So I, I, I originally was, my one-line pitch was kind of, I want to make Pan's Labyrinth meet Straw Dogs. And it was inspired by a lot of 70s movies, um, Straw Dogs and films like Deliverance and Alien, and, and then monster movies like The Thing and, and Evil Dead and The Fly. And it was sort of wanting to do my own version of, of uh, you know, a kind of horror movie, which was a little bit of a love letter to monsters um, with a mythology based in fairy and folklore, Irish folklore. Um, and I knew that I didn't want to do a kind of straight gothic fairy tale that just felt fantastical, as much as I loved that too. Um, you know, I, some, something like Ridley Scott's Alien was this sort of benchmark in my head of a, a, like a high quality movie that had this incredible mythology and great performances and was kind of a haunted house movie on a spaceship with a monster that had been really like incredibly rendered. and. Um, and Guillermo was a, is a big influence as well. And so it was trying to marry up a story that would allow that kind of mythology, but trying to ground it in ideas that could be real. I think the idea of fairy tales and, and beliefs in fairy tales being real, and especially you know going to places like Ireland, they're like 
treated as, as sacred text almost. And um, so I wanted to sort of dig into fairy mythology and folklore and really kind of imagine it into reality and think how it could, could you know, and, and finding actually a sort of link with biology and science and nature and, and contemporary kind of situations and human invasion. I'd really like to ask about the Irish background to it because mm -hmm. this is this is what I've written about because I've, I've, I'm working currently on on contemporary Irish horror and particularly the Irish horror of the of the post crash period and the yeah. ways in which it engages with that. Um, do you have any um, any Irish background yourself, or was this a, a, something you came to more sort of intellectually, or uh, were you scared by the Irish in childhood as I was? I wasn't, I, and, and actually after making this film, everyone assumes and thinks I am Irish, because I've got I a funny sounding name, but uh, <laughs> I, I'm not, I think I've probably got a little bit of Irish blood there, but uh, no, it was, it was really, you know, looking at monster, you know, folklore and, and mythology and trying to find a place that you could get lost in, and so, you know, I, I, think, I thought about Scotland, or, you know, there, there's similar mythology in Cornwall, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, and, and anywhere that I guess you go a little bit more far-reaching and you can and you get into real nature and forests and mountains. And that idea that the book Invasion, Book of Invasions is based on is that when humans sort of arrived and they invaded nature and they drove the, the beings into the sort of darkness and away, you know, into the shadows and into the trees. So naturally you've got the cities and fairy folklore probably doesn't hang out too much in the cities and stuff. but. Uh, that was where it came from. I, I did then. We did a lot of research into folklore, and it is obviously enormous. And there's so many different fascinating ideas, creatures, rules. So actually, part of the challenge in coming up with what was originally called the Good People. Can I switch the uh, onto my laptop, and then I can just show some visuals? So I brought my original artwork and books. I, I always start in my sketchbooks here. And you can't obviously see what's in these, so I've put, put it onto my laptop. So <clears throat> forgive me if this is a bit erratic, but I've, I've just dug up a load of my old original documents. So originally the film was called The Good People. And this was, so I made The Hallow, I shot in 2014. This was after about four years of work, and this was in 2010. And this was like put together to try and get awareness from producers and financiers. And my first thing here is a different kind of fairy. And it was sort of taking a look at fairy folklore and trying to imagine how it could become terrifying. And it was a case of limiting the amount of rules and folklore so we could only concentrate on a certain amount. Otherwise, they get, there's so many, you know, there's, there was a great idea that I think, for instance, to trick a changeling into uh, admitting it's a changeling, you had to like boil some eggs and um, like. Uh, it, it almost becomes too uh, complicated to, to render visually, so we, we, we sort of boil it down to a certain amount of rules. And I sort of put together fo photos like this, which was actually my girlfriend in a tree. Um, <laughs> and then I was drawing, a lot of what you see here was the first wave of how to do it, and, and you know, budget limitations also played a factor in what I could and couldn't do. There was a lot more monsters originally, these were spriggans. But I love this idea that these creatures were actually kind of almost formed out of the, the, the rot and the infections and things in, in the forest itself and the, like almost like rotten leaves and animal bones and things like that. Um, these were early drawings of this idea of the beams of a house growing buds and Adam originally out there in the forest with a camera. <clears throat> he had a giant wrench at that point. Um, some images on his on his photography down here, weird imagery. That scene in Jaws, I always loved in Jaws 2, I think, when you see the photo coming through the shark's eye. Um, sort of set piece in the, in the house I did. And I do all these sketches very quick and just try and sort of build the world of the movie. And we had Claire oh, down here with, she had a ball, balls of wool originally instead of the yellow blanket that was going to be like. I mean, the other, the other sort of aim with, with The Hallow was to tell a movie that felt grounded in reality, like a relationship drama that may have no monsters in and be a psychological thriller. But as the movie goes on, and it, there is almost a point in the middle, which is the car starting when you first see them, it ramps into 
and an actual fairy tale. So there's, there's sort of imagery in that second half where you see the, the, the sort of the woodsman, you know, corrupted, turning into a creature. You have sort of the changeling, you have the, the banshee, and you have um, these sort of more classic fairy tale ideas, and the look of the whole film gets progressively more subtly heightened, you know. So if I wanted to use fire and, and light and elements. And this was these were called the slua, which which I love this idea in fairy mythology, you have the seely court and the unseely court. And the unseely court I haven't heard of, but it is basically the, the bad fairies. So we've, you know, become accustomed with fairies being these like twinkly little tinkerbells from Disney and you know, in fairy stories, but a lot of even kids' fairy stories are pretty dark actually, and they deal with changelings and baby stealers and stuff. So it's also just trying to find ways of incorporating these sort of classic fairy tale ideas in into this <laughs> unraveling, quite simple tale of this couple. There was a whole 10 minute sequence that actually no one's seen, which I, when I watch it now with all this time, I'm kind of, I, I do at some point want to do a, a director's cut, and it would really probably include the 10 minutes I locked off <laughs> for Sundance. Um, and it actually sets up the couple a lot more and you learn the state of their relationship and their sort of trauma around having the baby <coughs> starts in London. Um, and it's, a, it's another story, but uh, yeah, there is, there is actually, I think it would probably be more powerful as, as an end point <coughs> when you see the first 10 minutes. As you mentioned the baby, mm. um, whose baby was it? There's a lot of babies, right? So there's six. There was a pair of twins, lovely Irish twins who were five months old, James and Joe, I believe they were called. And um, we just did Gangs of London, and if anyone's seen that, there's also a bunch of babies, and we had a pair of twins in that too. Um, the, the gist is, you know, when one baby starts to feel tired or hungry, uh, you swap them. And they're, they're never actually in discomfort. Normally they're just a bit hungry and you get a kind of 20 second bit of them crying before they get swapped that translates into some like ter terrible trauma going on. So there was a pair of real life twins. There was then a fully animatronic baby, which John Nolan, who's uh, did an, a formidable amount of work on this, John Nolan's studio, was kind of someone who got recommended to me. A fantastic workshop. I was on the lookout for a kind of modern day robot team sort of Rick Baker, Stan Winston, Dick Smith character, and found him. And I mean, at the time, and with the lack of the money that we didn't have, he, he did a phenomenal amount of work. After the Hallow, he went on to do the whole of the Dark Crystal show on Netflix, all of the creatures. And then he's just done Jurassic World Dominion, this is his latest film, and he's built the biggest dinosaurs ever on screen. So he's, he started on the Hallow. I mean, he did a bit before the Hallow as well, but, um, and he, he, he created these, so. Um, I can't remember what your question was. The baby. The baby. So yeah, two real ones, a fully animatronic one, which was amazing, and would be used in some of the shots in the second half of the film when it's kind of like we're acting a bit strange. But also you could do shots of characters holding the baby and it would kind of move around. Then we had a fully weighted stunt replica for all the shots when anyone's doing anything dangerous running around, even just running down a field. You can't run with a real baby. Um, then we had a changeling baby, and then my own daughter played the opening baby. When you see him on the boat, that was like a little reshoot about four months after editing when I decided to lop off the first 10 minutes of the movie. I wanted to shoot this arrival of a couple, kind of inspired by what the Wicker Man, the structure of the Wicker Man, where originally, if, you, if anyone's seen the director's cut, that was a sort of 10 minute sequence um, of Edward Woodward kind of going about his job and he gets, he receives the sort of letter to come to the island and um, and, it, and it sets it all up and, and that in, in a way when they, they had cut that and the Wicker Man, that, the only version of the Wicker Man I'd seen up to that point was just when you, you begin on the aeroplane flying in, he arrives, there, you're there. So I felt <laughs> kind of like that what they had done was similar to what I decided to do. Um, so my daughter ran who was literally the same age as the boys. She, she was born two weeks before we started shooting. And um, <clears throat> my wife and daughter came out to set six weeks later. And she kind of has grown up around these monsters. That was pretty much my question, was that your child? Because there was a, yeah. 
there was a shot in the um, making of Doco uh -huh. in which you're sitting on the sofa yeah. with the baby yeah. and you are holding that baby in a way that, you know, this baby's not a prop and it's not a cast member, it, it very much looked like yeah. it was yours. Yeah, um, so yeah, she's in the boat for those first shots. Uh, that, that first sequence, could I just ask you about it? Because it, it was... It was phenomenally interesting to me because I, I'm really interested in the way that Irish horror has just exploded, and I, you know, it was it was as you say filmed in Ireland, uh, Irish Film Board supported, so I treat it very much as an Irish movie. Um, and you choose to have that radio program playing, um, which is is the kind of political mm -hmm. part of the film in many yeah. ways, and I, I I'm really interested in. In, I, I think I know what you're doing there. Yeah. I'm really interested in what you were actually doing. Well, it was, it was to sort of help ground it and set it in a contemporary place, which is what had happened in Ireland. Um, the, and when I went over there to Location Scout, I was looking for sort of big spooky houses, but I was shocked to see so many, like huge oh, houses yeah. that have been built that are empty, mm. that are crumbling. And literally that house that you see in the forest is real as well. And, and so, as a result of, <clears throat> well, the, the, you say, call it the crash. Mm. Um, and, and, and this idea that we're, you know, human invaders and, and invading nature and uh, just fucking things up, basically. <clears throat> and then it was in this sort of financial situation. The idea that Adam had been sent to Ireland in that, in the opening 10 minutes that I cut, you actually see him in his job in London, and he's he's working for this kind of um, forestry commission, but he's doing like desk jobs, and his wife's got the baby at home, and they're having a stressful time. And then <clears throat> his superiors say, "Look, we need you, we want you to go to Ireland. Um, you can get some air. You need to have a house out there. Um, we need you to assess a forest. But instead of it being really about nature and saving the forest, it's about they want to sell the forest. So actually, that end scene is." as if that forest that we've just been in, this sort of sacred place, is getting turned over anyway, and it's been sold off to you know, different financiers. And so, yeah, so, yeah, stripped, denuded. Um, it, it, there's real similarities, I thought, parallels to Lock and Finnegan's movie, No Name. I've not seen it. Uh, ah, that's so interesting you haven't seen it, because he, he too sends an Englishman into the right. Irish forest, right. and in his case, he's a surveyor, Mm. And he's there to measure the forest so that they yeah. can effectively sell it because someone's bought it up cheap. At when the was end that made? Uh, I can't remember. After <laughs> yours. Right. Um, he's obviously it. seen yours. Mm. Yeah, um, and, and, you know, something terrible happens to the Englishman in the forest in both of these sure. films. Um, it, it's a film that I think the Guardian critic, um, Bill Hode, I think his name is, uh, described it as so trippy as to make a field in England look like an afternoon in the tax wow. office. So it's a, it's a great film if people haven't seen it. Um, mm. But yes, Englishmen coming coming a coming awry in Irish forests seem to have a, sure. a distinctly political dimension going yeah. into it. Yeah. I'm going to carry on with Eve. So this, these were early drawings of a banshee, which sort of became Cora, became a version of a banshee. And these were like concepts that I put together. Ch changeling. Oh. We knew we wanted to kind of create a changeling, and actually the part of the story when things clicked was this idea of having two babies, and one's a changeling and one's not, and, and, and our kind of two protagonists' point of views are shifting because he's becoming, um, you know, the creature. Um, didn't do wisp lights, but that was going to be in there. And we, we had a big kind of deer sequence where the deer got infected, which we had to reduce down, but that was a um, really nice product model deer that we had in there. And there was kind of a bit more of a kind of Queen Alien like um, Beast of the One Hand <coughs> Fairy in his early version. But I loved all the tree roots and the kind of environment. These are our characters. And I kind of plotted out the geography of how I needed it, and we found a place and was able to build and, and adjust. I wanted the forest to be a real barrier, like uh, entering the forest was stepping into a world. And how, a, how did you find the house? God, man, I saw hundreds and hundreds. It was like finding a lead actor. I mean, it was, there were so many specific elements that we needed from exterior and interior. 
And uh, originally, I really wanted this kind of classic fairy tale cottage house that I had in my head, which I thought, there's going to be a million in Ireland, you know, these like big kind of old stone walled houses. And we literally, we had, looked at hundreds, and I think the only ones that we found that looked amazing from the outside were actually the walls are like a meter thick, and they're really tiny inside. So actually, and I wanted somewhere cinematic that you could have, he's going to have a big geography, and he's got the different rooms, he's got his office lab, it's got a lounge, it's got a kitchen scene, it's got stairs, it's got landings, attics. And so we found this quite large. The interior of what you saw um, was fantastic, but the exterior wasn't what I had in mind, which is also what you saw. But it had to, and then I like this idea that maybe because he was being posted out there, it was kind of a, a house owned by the Forestry Commission or something. Um, it had a garden sloping towards some trees, but it wasn't where you see it. It was just on the edge of the coast, actually, and it had the ocean there, or a big lake. So we had to do some clever, like, uh, camera geography where you kind of join different locations together, because the location with the farm and the barn was sort of 10 miles down the road. Um, yeah. So this is um, this idea of Claire having to go off and, on a mission to rescue Finn coming back with him while Adam's sort of transforming in the house. This is an early, it was originally called The Good People. He mentions The Good People in the, um, you know, <clears throat> Michael's uh, The Cop. Um, I thought it was originally called The Woods. It was called The Good People. And then there was a film that came out, I think like a James Franco movie called The Good People. So I was like, we can't call it that. And then I wanted to go really simple with it, like, you know, Alien or Jaws, and what you know, naming it in, in, in the woods. And I know there'd been a Lucky McGee movie called The Woods, so I sort of didn't know if it was allowed to, you know, call your movie another name. And then I think in the marketing, we all agreed that we needed something more unique. And and we've been talking about the Hallow, and we also thought we can kind of create our own mythology in there as well. So it became the Hallow. So that, I'm going to whiz through another document. That was the early, early one. And then. This was kind of the sales document, if I remember correctly, which was still, I don't think we'd shot it yet, but we'd started to get altitude and on board. So we kind of put this together to, to raise money, which sort of helped tell the story, what I wanted to do. And then I also included sketches. <coughs> And I, I did a lot of sort of my own concept sketches of sequences that I wanted to capture a kind of tension in. And in this, you know, this sequence of creature coming up through trapdoor, the mother trying to fend it off with a torch that's running out of a wind up, and, and uh, it starts growing towards her eye. Him going into the sort of den of creatures, becoming one himself. And then it is, I did a sort of series of prosthetic designs for his transformation as he starts to change. More, more kind of creature stuff and storyboards. Um, so I, I, I'll just take you through this quickly. This was a, a storyboard of the whole movie, um, almost every scene. And this was a sort of sample scene of the car starting sequence in the middle. So you can sort of see car, it, it was in a field originally, but we shot it in the forest. He's trying to start the car. He's shining the light into the engine and sees this growth. He starts taking it out while she's getting progressively more and more nervous inside the car. She's looking in the mirror with the baby in the back seat. She's starting the keys. Engine, the lights are full flickering. He's trying to get the growth out, <clears throat> sees what it is, and sort of he build up the presence of the creatures. And then uh, she starts to see something in the brake lights behind her. She starts to panic. She's about revving the car. And then the light dies down. She starts to panic. He's, he's sort of telling her you know, what, when to start the car. And then there's kind of like, each time she revs it, there's more. Until they get close enough. And then he sort of didn't quite get this, but you know, there's going to be a real kind of deep rooted area that he had to get to, and, uh, and you, I wanted to see his hand go kind of in, and then just as he's getting it, she starts the car and is going to just like take his knuckles up. 
and then the bonnet dropping and seeing these things behind him. And that sequence, particularly the car, when it was sort of started and racing through the field, that was, <laughs> that was such a nightmare. It was, it was, um, there'd been really bad weather and it was horizontal rain for four or five days or something. The field we had location scouted is a peat bog field, which is basically like a, a massive sponge. And it absorbs all the water. And um, so for this kind of like low budget movie, having a car sequence where the car had to sort of skid around a field and then crash in a ditch was kind of quite a big number. And it was the day I remember that the, the bond company came to check on how production was going. They, they basically had the ability to close it down if they think you're not doing it right. And, uh, and I had five cameras, I think, for that scene. Um, we had the car ready, we had the stunt guys in the car, and then all of these creatures, they had like five creature costume, sorry, cr creature performers all in their full suits. Those suits were like, with full heads, where you could hardly breathe in them. So if you imagine it's like three in the morning in a peat bog field, freezing cold, and you've got these performers crawling around on their hands that can hardly see or hear, um, and they're having to crawl around this marshland. And then, uh, anyway, when it got to that moment, <coughs> and I called action, the car just wheel spinned in the mud and then slowly kind of crept forward and stopped before it got to the fence it was meant to crash through and everyone's like looking at me the the, the producers and the bonds people are kind of like starting to like wonder and it was because the stunt guy had for some reason not put down the metal tracks that he had put down for the car to grip on and uh, it was all looking up terrible at that moment and we actually had to get a quad bike to like cable tie onto the car and pull the car through the field and then raise the quad bike and the effects and stuff like that. So challenges of, of shooting this kind of stuff. And, and most of the film was shot on location, isn't it? Oh yeah, yeah. Pretty much all so it's all shot on location and then we shot um, the attic in the house and the den, the creature den, uh, were the only two main sets that were shot sort of... Um, in a, in a small studio in Ireland, Roger Corman's studio. Um, and, uh, but you know, stuff like her going in the lake, that's really Boyana Novakovic going in the lake at four in the morning in November or something. It was also just like, and I, and I was like swimming in the lake, pushing the camera um, boat along because we didn't have anyone to, no divers or anything like that. So yeah, we had some, the whole shoot was, I think it was like 28 days. It was one of those, Ultra memorable, I'll never forget it. Uh, uh, but it was like every day it was absolute madness. I, 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 you hear about cursed movies, it sounds like a blessed movie, and then <laughs> no one actually died. I know about that, yeah, no one died. I nearly did do that die at one point on a, but, uh, and I felt because there's, there's, there's a lot of um, superstition that you don't mess with fairies, like you shouldn't, absolutely. you shouldn't tell stories about yeah. them because they don't like it. And uh, actually, whilst out there, yeah, there was some strange occurrences um, <laughs> where I wondered whether the fairies were disapproving of us. And yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, having been, uh, you know, being of Irish descent, I think it's a very brave thing to make, um, make the movie, and, and perhaps, you know, perhaps a little foolish <laughs> um, for your own for your own self preservation. Um, I've, I've been told it's pretty much time to ask some um, oh, questions yeah. of the audience. So is there sure. is there more you'd like to run through? I'm just going to whiz through this last one because I, I mean I've I brought all sorts. To, there is there is um we made a really nice making of which was all made out of my personal behind the scenes on doing the shoot, which is only on I think like the, the UK or the German DVD or something, and I want to get it out on a, a channel because it's a sort of 45 minute behind the scenes completely like it's not um slick it's like made by by me and us um and, it, and it, i have loads of behind the scenes stills but i don't know how long we we have but this this was the last book this was like when i got to sundance so i, I was finishing the post on the movie and it was to show it was talking about creating a new monster and putting together a sort of presentation with my sketches um storyboards and then this is what I wanted to show some of the other creature concept art so I got some great concept artists this is Ivan Manzella uh, who took my sketches and we started to render like what they could actually be how biologically what was happening and then physically how we were going to create the suits because I wanted to create everything as much as possible in camera and do it with puppetry and so these were we created these suits where the puppets um, 
There's some images of, of these are the maquettes up here. Um, the sculpts, this is the deer. Who's got is, the baby? This is one of the, I've got the baby. <laughs> I've got everything. <laughs> That's why I've got these. Um, you know, we had a, a really nice animatronic hollow arm for the, the arm that unfolds itself. Um, and yeah, I wanted to create suits that the performers could wear that they would almost puppeteer their own extra limbs whilst crawling around with his extra limbs added on. So this was some of the full size. Connor, who played the, the sort of lead sinuous hallow that gets the most, he was fantastic. He was sort of trained in animal movements. So he was, he had the most like amazing. It was extensively choreographed, wasn't it? All the movements of the, of yeah. the performers. It was, we had a great guy called Peter Elliott who, who worked on the Greystoke Tarzan movie play in the ape, very much like a kind of an Andy Serkis character. Yeah. He was really good with creature movements and sounds and he I got him and we, we did a quite an uh, in-depth process of casting the creatures by holding auditions for sort of ballerinas, contortionists, mountain climbers, theatrical performers and we put them through a series of like um, trials <laughs> and then narrowed it down to five and one of them, Charlotte, who is, is tiny and she could play Cora because she had a full animatronic entire head that was like putting her head inside one of the contraptions from Saw, and then she had to like, perform that scene when Adam, played by Joseph Moore, um, is standing in front of her, and they have a little exchange about the baby. Joe's in full prosthetics, contact lenses. He also has a hearing, um, a real hearing um, condition that means he can't hear very well. So he couldn't really hear, he couldn't see. He's got a flaming sign. She's standing there in full animatronic head. She can't see. She can't hear. The baby's full animatronic. There's, there's like eight guys controlling radio, controlling the baby. And I think we had a real baby to put in there for a moment. Um, and if you get yourself into those sort of interesting situations when you're trying to make a movie. And so I always come out of that scene because it looks like they, look like they can see each other even there. Absolutely. This is some of the prosthetic work, really fantastic. Tristan Vasluis, who's who created this, again, he's gone on to do all the biggest movies that we have at the moment. Um, these were some of the, the creature performers to give you an idea of these extra limbs here, which are built like on the shoulders down to the arms, because uh, I wanted them in real low positions, so we built their heads on top of their heads. So if you look at this creature on the left there, the, the head is almost built upwards on top, um, so they would they could be looking kind of down, but their heads would be up. Um, and then this is Peter Elliot down here. And this is a bit of some of the filming. And then a bit of visual effects. And we did obviously use quite a lot of visual effects, but subtly to erase things. This was the animatronic changeling. This was kind of what the house looked like, but it wasn't in the woods, and then we put the woods in. Cora. Now, this is sort of, you can see the performer's arms just here. So it was a way of actually doing it in camera, and some of the shots with the grade, you just couldn't see the arms, otherwise you needed to, like, visual effect them out. So yeah, should we do some questions? Absolutely, thank you very much. Questions? Anyone ask a question, I've brought two of the last ever Hallow t-shirts that I had printed, and I've brought two copies of The Nun, so I can happily throw them out to you, if you're That's brave enough. For you guys. Guys. I think, yeah. I think yeah. Lee Hodgkinson also had a question, maybe, is he here? Would you like to ask a question, yeah. then we'll come back to you in a sec. Uh, great film, by the way. Thank you, man. Uh, what is it? It's, Say where the Pope is slightly. Yeah. Uh, the on the hour. It said you were speaking about doing a movie version of The Crow, you know, a while back. Yeah. Is it something you'd still be interested in? They made The Crow. We'll just show it in the yeah. Yeah. In the future. Yeah, I love The Crow. I'm, uh, you know, I spent four and a half years nearly making it, but I'd rather talk about the Hatter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering whether to throw you a t-shirt on that. <laughs> <laughs> and let's have some questions that are to do with the hammer. Not quite this microphone, you'll have to speak up loud. Who was that? Sorry, yeah. Yeah, 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 y
glad that I managed to get it. I almost missed the entire thing. Um, but I'm glad that I managed to get a seat. Me um, too. Uh, I just wanted to ask, like, with that last scene with the baby, how much of that was actually prosthetic and how much of it was like effect? There's a lot of, I mean, almost all of the scenes in that last half with the baby that you're seeing a mixture of all these different versions. So it sort of was dictated that, obviously, if there was any like drama scene close up, it's a real baby. If it's um, any sort of action going on, it has to be the animatronic one or the stunt one. Um, then there's some visual effects enhancements going on. And then actually the, the changing when it came apart was, was intended to almost resemble that sort of old school stop motion feel. And it's, a, and it's a visual effect combined with a puppet. Um, and I wanted to almost play with Adam's deteriorating point of view from when he's starting to get infected and you know he's getting his flashes and he's seeing that that, that changeling kind of rendered. That's like when you're in full 100% fairy tale mode in a way. So you're seeing that this actual changeling come apart. You're seeing Adam transformed in the forest. Would you like a medium or a large Hello T-shirt or a copy of The Nuns? Yeah. I'm going to throw it. Okay. <laughs> um, I may have lied, and they may only be large, but they're quite small, large. Let's see if I can get it to you. <laughs> Somebody's going to get it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a challenge. Mm. is that one thing that really stood out to me in your movie was the lighting and also the sound as well. Yeah. And I just wanted to kind of elaborate, like what was your concept when it came to your pitch deck or when it came to your, uh, your directorship? And what was like the concept when it came to the actual sound itself and light itself? Because that's for me that really stand out. In the sound? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the lighting was really key. The cinematographer, Martijn von Broekhuizen, is a Dutch DP. It was the first time we worked together, but I'd heard lots of things about him. And actually, I'd had a DP on board to shoot this, and then he, at the last minute, had to, he had sort of owed someone else a movie before me. So he disappeared, and actually, as I got into pre-production, had to find a DP quite quick. Martijn, who I've worked with since on everything, and he's shot all of my gang stuff. Um, He's a, he's a master of light. I mean, he's a real like artist and uh, you know like a Dutch kind of art house kind of DP. So I kind of wanted to combine his like beautiful art house cinematography with my heavy genre vibes, and that's what the, the kind of the balance helped the tone of the movie feel like grounded but fantastical and sort of like merged together. Um, but also in in terms of like horror movies and atmosphere and mood but also with the halo built into the sort of mythology of how light's used the light sources were always really critical in terms of when it's dark when it's moonlight when it's electrical light when it's wind up torch light when it's firelight um, and when it's natural light so it was all scrutinized through in the prep and um but then sound is as you know kind of 50 percent of everything you know and i, I worked in um, Steve Fanagan in, in Ireland, fantastic guy, and we, I just keep layering and layering and layering, so there's a lot of, you know, sound effects and natural sound and weird stuff. We did all the creatures ourselves, so I was able to, <laughs> kind of stuff. <laughs> um, we did, you know, we had a lot of fun <laughs> creating the, the creature sounds and trying to actually build the kind of strange, the closer you get and towards the end, there's this sort of communication like a family almost going on. We didn't want them to just be roaring and stuff, but yeah. Okay, we've probably got time for one last question. This is almost the last t-shirt that exists. <laughs> hey. Hey. Nice. So, it was illustrated by Dave Lupton, who did all the illustrations in the Hello book and did the Num book and does all my illustration stuff. Sim's stated down here, had a hand up for okay, us, got, they? Okay, we've got two brief, two quick questions, and then, but Corinne, you're going to be outside if people want to come and say Yeah, that. I'll go out after this, I'll take a couple of monsters and just, like, um, if everyone, anyone wants to, like, chat or have... We'll have 
Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.